Thank you all for joining us here at I-80 Sports, where today it's our week five recap. And whoo boy, it's a good thing that we waited a few days to release this one because it has been a doozy of a week in the NHL. You don't want to miss this. Guys, thank you all for joining us here again at I-80 Sports. you guys for joining us here again at iid sports make sure that you subscribe down below youtube.com slash iid sports and hit the bell notification so that way you know when our videos go live beyond just our nhl content we've got nfl mls ncaa football mlb nba probably other sports in the future as well you don't want to miss any of that the way you don't Hit subscribe down below. Hit the bell notification so that way you guys know when we go live. Also, drop a comment down below with what your thoughts from this bonkers week in the NHL has been. We want to hear from you guys. We want to conversate down below. So let us know what you guys think. And also, drop a like while you're there. We would greatly appreciate that. Speaking of great appreciation, if you're still on X, make sure to follow us down below at i80 underscore sports NHL. And if you follow us already, thank you guys so much because we greatly value all of your support. But <laughs> Let's dive into this. I'm Brian. He's Tom. Tom, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. And, you know, our first couple episodes going into this season have been pretty uh, tame, have been pretty calm. But kaboom, man. Wow. We got a lot happening right now. A lot. And it was funny, too, because, like, full full disclosure, we usually try to record these episodes on a Sunday. And the weekend kind of got away from, you know, both. Tom and I and didn't you know, get away from me. My power down. went out. My power went out for seven hours Sunday night. Yeah, exactly. Literally, the power went out. Like it was a windy, rainy day on Sunday, just ugly in general. And uh, you know, with Turkey Day, and I celebrated two Turkey Days, so it's just kind of tough in that regard. But we were all already kind of grasping at straws of like news stories, and then all of a sudden, boom! Monday news story, boom! All of today's news stories, like for Tuesday, the day that we're recording this, Tuesday, uh, November 28th, 2023. And uh, yeah, crazy. So without further ado, let's talk about these crazy headlines. Time to hit up the traffic report. The I-80 Sports Traffic Report, where you can find all your news and notes from the week. As you guys know, our traffic traffic report is reserved for our top NHL stories of the week. And uh, I wasn't kidding when I said a lot of the news stories broke today and yesterday. So let's start with the biggest news story today. Probably the one that we've been monitoring for the past few weeks here. If you've been catching our episodes here at IED Sports. Patrick Kane, we don't have to guess anymore where he is going. We know where the destination lies. And lo and behold... He is going to become a member of the Detroit Red Wings. So Patrick Kane, right winger, has signed and is intending to sign, rather. There's no details on contracts yet. There's no details on money or years yet. But he has now come out and said, I intend to sign with the Detroit Red Wings. Tom, right off the bat, what are your thoughts? How does this impact the Red Wings going forward with this season? Do you think this was a good choice by both the Red Wings and Patrick Kane, and do you think any teams miss out? To tell you the truth, I don't know if this is a good idea. I'm going to be honest with you. The Red Wings are having a great season, yeah. One of their best seasons in years, definitely. What was carrying the Red Wings was the first line of Alex Dabrinkit, um, Dylan Larkin, and Lucas Raymond. Well, now you're breaking that line up. You're probably going to put Kane and Raymond spot, which is fine. You have to bring Cat and Kane together. You figure it, it'll it'll create magic again, like him and Panarin did last year, right? That sort of didn't work. Um, and I don't really know if this is the answer for Detroit. I don't. I think Detroit needed improvement in other in certain areas, yes. But I don't know if bringing him in and forcing him onto that first line is the answer right now for the Red Wings. On top of which, Kane has been quoted as saying himself. He wants to try to go deep and win the Stanley Cup. 
No disrespect to the Red Wings because they're having a good year. I I think this team, best case scenario, maybe wins one playoff round. These aren't the Detroit Red Wings of old. These aren't the Detroit Red Wings of the late 90s who were Stanley Cup contenders every year. I don't know if this is such a good idea for the Red Wings. I don't. They're they're not one step away from the Stanley Cup. This isn't like bringing in Brett Hall or Luke Robitaille, or even when we go want to go further back, Brendan <laughs> Manahan in 97, who was the missing piece of that Stanley Cup puzzle. I think maybe on paper it improves them. You're bringing somebody with some talent in, yes, but you're breaking up the first line that's driven you all year, and this doesn't put the Wings any closer to the Stanley Cup. They're in no way they weren't winning the cup this year. The Red Wing fans themselves, who I've read some some uh, reactions from today, have said, "Okay, this is kind of just a veteran guy to bring the team along." But this team's not. This team is not a Stanley Cup contender. This team is not a Stanley Cup winning team. And I think they're right. Now, do I want to say I'm a homer alert here and think the Rangers lost out? Yeah, I think that maybe if this if this injury to Capo Caco happened two or three weeks ago. Or we knew what was going on with Filipino, which we don't right now. They said he skated by himself the other day, but then LTI would him today. If there were more certainties with them two, maybe you would have heard more from them. And the interesting part about it is, I think we knew he wasn't going to go to Toronto. Just with the way with the Leafs were built, I just don't think they need him. But the team that I thought would get him, besides the Rangers, the Florida Panthers have remained awfully quiet. I guess the Panthers had cap issues and just couldn't figure it out. And to tell you the truth, I think he would have fit best on the Rangers because the Rangers need a right wing in the worst way right now, but they're out. I look at Florida's first line, Evan Rodriguez, Alexander Barkov, and Sam Reinhart. He would have fit very nicely on that first line in Florida. He would have. And I'm just surprised that there was no pushback. There was nothing by the Panthers. He was rumored to be going to the Panthers last week. That's all anybody was talking about. And it's just, it's crickets down in Miami. And I think, and I hate to say it because I don't really like the Panthers. I didn't like that they went to the finals last year. I think they punched above their weight. I think they're still punching above their weight. But I'm going to tell you right now, I think the Panthers are closer to a cup than the Red Wings are. So I don't know if this is a good idea. And I'm going to end it with this to top it all off. He had that hip surgery that a lot of guys couldn't come back from. Ryan Kessler comes to mind. Nicholas Backstrom comes to mind. Ed Jovanovsky comes to mind, even though he sort of did come back from it. So I, I just... It, it, it's strange for Detroit to do this. A young team trying to gain experience with a guy coming back from a hip injury who has been quoted as saying he wants to go deep and win the Stanley Cup. It's it it to me it just doesn't add up. That's just my two cents. I can understand where you're coming from, but let's take a look real quick uh via daily faceoff uh at these lines for the Detroit Red Wings currently at the moment. Also bearing in mind that you do have a few key injuries right now for uh, the Detroit Red Wings. Namely, you have Dylan Larkin out at the moment, uh, preview for our injury report. But I think you could conceivably make this work without breaking up the band. I don't think you have to play Patrick Kane on your top line, especially coming off hip surgery. He's not a guy that's going to command 20 to 22 minutes a night. I just don't see it right now, especially, you know, Patrick Kane's not that old, realistically. However, Lucas Raymond, he's young. He's proven now and really, you know, hit his stride with Alex Dabrinkit and Dylan Larkin. And I think that would be a legitimate concern by Steve Eiserman, the general manager of the Detroit Red Wings, to not break up such a potent line at the moment. So I don't think realistically Patrick Kane slots in as your first line right winger. However, maybe moving Robbie Fabry down and playing Patrick Kane on the right-hand side with Jonathan Berggren and uh, eventually JT Comfer when he uh, moves back down might be a really solid idea. I mean, obviously, you're not signing Patrick Kane to play below that more than likely. You're not signing him to be a top-nine pairing guy unless you want to give Michael Rasmussen and Joe Volano a little bit of a boost on the right-hand side instead of David Perron. But I don't think Patrick Kane has to live on that top line. You look also at that bottom line, Clem Costin is probably expendable at this point. He has two points in his first 16 games. It just looks like the experiment hasn't quite paid off. He makes a little, a, a few really nice plays here and there, and there's certainly flashes of aggression and strong play on the puck 
However, when you got a guy like Patrick Kane coming in, a player like Clem Costin, unfortunately, is expendable and easy to move down to the AHL or you know place on waivers to see if he can clear waivers to head down to the AHL to Grand Rapids if he really wanted to. Um, but I just wanted to take a look at this line. I just want to take a look at these lines real quick. Bear in mind that you don't necessarily have to play Patrick Kane at the top if you don't want to. Um, ultimately, my reaction is I think regardless, I think this is a solid move by Detroit. I think any team adding Patrick Kane at the right price and the right length is ultimately a good move. And it's still yet to be seen what Patrick Kane is going to look like post-surgery once he's actually healed up and ready to go. But if you're getting anything like Patrick Kane that we saw in Chicago, I think you're going to be happy no matter what. And I think he's going to provide an immediate boost to a Detroit Red Wings team that's already finding the back of the net very well. Now, as Tom mentioned, yeah, you could have also addressed other areas of this team. However, you can also add now and maybe make one or two players expendable by adding Patrick Kane, depending on how long you add him for. So who knows? There could be more fallout from this for Detroit. Maybe this isn't the last move that Detroit makes in lieu of picking up Patrick Kane. So we're going to be monitoring this for the next few weeks and seeing what kind of happens. And it's funny that we mentioned, you know, a former Chicago Blackhawk because now there is another former Chicago Blackhawk that we need to talk about here, Tom. And uh, there's been rumors abound with this particular player. And uh, I'm not going to, you know, be here to beat a dead horse with another dead horse. But uh, just come out and say it. Uh Former Chicago Blackhawks forward Corey Perry uh, has been placed on waivers today by a Chicago Blackhawks with the intent of terminating his contract. And it is in lieu of, quote, unacceptable behavior. Now, there are rumors abound. I'm not going to say what the lead rumor is. However, if you're savvy of the movie American Pie and a particular scene at the end of that movie, you can kind of put two and two together of what Corey Perry possibly did with a particular relative of Connor Bedard's. However, there are wild rumors abound with that. And general manager Kyle Davidson has come out and said there is there was no conduct that took place between a player or a anybody related to a player on the Chicago Blackhawks. And anybody thinking that is, quote, disgusting and wrong so i'm not going to speculate but it's obvious here there are some real problems in chicago lately there are some significant culture problems in chicago right now tom immediate reactions here what's next for Corey perry and what's next for chicago blackhawks well, the Blackhawks probably did the right thing. Like I said, we don't know what happened it, it could have been that it could have been something else it could have just been it could have been that he was doing something else that they deemed, you know, unprofessional or whatever. It's not the first time that a team has had a young a young up-and-coming star or stars with an established veteran in the room that they had to get out of that room. It happened in Anaheim back in 05. Ryan Getzlaff and Corey Perry were two young, impressionable stars coming up. Sergei Fedorov was there in Anaheim. Fedorov at the time was living it up. He wasn't living in Detroit, who we just spoke about, where it's winter, seven months out of the year, where you can't live in the city of Detroit. You live in the suburbs. You live basically a suburban life in an area where it's cold. Fedorov was living up the dream in Orange County, on the beach, going out, having fun. And here are these two kids coming up for the future. And Fedorov was told to cut it out. He didn't cut it out. It came to the point where it was so much so that Brian Burke sent Getzlaff and Perry down to the minors until he could trade Federoff out of Anaheim. Was something like this the same way in Chicago? Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. And maybe with him around, maybe with Taylor Hall going down, knowing they'd have to play him more and he wasn't going to straighten himself out, they knew they had to get him out. Remember, Perry was kind of just a reach for them. They wanted Felino, They wanted Taylor Hall. I think Perry was just sort of just somebody who fell into their hands. He's gone now. Is his career over? I don't think so, to be honest with you. 
what he did, I don't think is going to get him blacklisted anywhere. It's not the first time something similar has happened like this. There's a team out there, one that I particularly know could use a right winger right now on a league minimum deal. I don't know if his career is generally over. He's done in Chicago, yeah. He's definitely done in Chicago. But that's not to say a team that needs a vet that needs some veteran help wouldn't reach out to him either. So I don't know if it's over for him. I really don't. Yeah. I know he's done there though. He won't be coming back there. No, he ain't coming back to Chicago more than likely. I mean, you got to feel for the fans of Chicago at the moment. Just like, it just feels like one thing after the next, after the next, after the next. And it's just, it's unrelenting at the moment. My heart goes out to Chicago fans. At least you got Connor Bedard. At least you got Connor Bedard. I mean, as for Corey Perry, who knows what's next? I mean, no matter what, Corey Perry like the guy or hate the guy he's more than likely a hall of fame player he's you know the next place after retirement what when he finally reaches retirement if this is his last stop uh is the hall of fame i do think that he is going to be inducted into the hockey hall of fame i don't know if his career is done yet though i think he's still got a little bit left in the tank i gotta think that a team is going to get desperate enough to you know call his agent and maybe request his services on the cheap you know finish the rest of the season maybe on a league minimum deal and see where it kind of goes uh otherwise right now all we have is speculation and we're probably not going to know the full details for months, maybe years, maybe decades from now, we don't find out what really happened in this situation. But, you know, it's not fair to necessarily speculate. It's not fair, you know, to say this is what happened or that's what happened. Although I will make light of things right now and be, you know, play the funny role to end this segment and just say wherever Corey Perry goes next, hide your moms, hide your dads, and maybe hide your children. That's all I'm going to say. Good luck. And if he goes to you know, the New York Rangers, Alexi Lafreniere, hide your mom. But anyway, going on uh, from this point on. Uh, before I go on to our next. At the same season, time, Lafreniere is 20. How old is he now? He's 21. Uh, 21, 20. I think he's basically on his own down in New York. He don't have his parents. Some of these guys, believe it or not. I think Ovechkin still has his parents living in his house in D.C. Yeah, I think he does. But that's also under special circumstances because, well other countries but well, uh, i'm just saying well often here technically from another country too but i don't oh, think yeah, any no, of that I'm, I'm just saying that you know a country that i'm not gonna name right now but... yeah i know i know i know <laughs> but what i'm saying is is that i think lafreniere is on his own down in new york i think he's quoted as saying he's living by himself too true uh we've got an update right now on the patrick kane contract because the details just got released as uh this episode has been rolling on um the Detroit Red Wings today have signed Patrick Kane to a one-year. Uh, it's a one-year contract for two point seven five million dollars. So, <laughs> pretty friendly. <laughs> pretty uh, that, friendly uh, it's it's mind-boggling a little bit with that, but that is a that is a proven deal, there. and that is a that. You cannot deny that Steve Eiserman is a smooth talker at that rate. Yeah, but you signed for 2.75 mil to not win the Stanley Cup. You figured he would have taken that with a team who was closer to it. I, it doesn't make sense. It is what it is. I'm just the messenger. <laughs> Tom, why, since you're feeling a little bit down, why don't you introduce this next headline? This might make you feel a little bit better. Tell us about this best on best uh, tournament that we could be getting in the coming years. Well, it's not in the coming years. This one that I'm going to talk about is just going to be a one-off. The plan is, and it's a plan that I've always wanted, and it's a plan that the NHL is really working for, is what they want to do is go back to the Olympics every four years, and then in the intervening even years, they want to have a World Cup over here on North American soil. Whether they have it in the summertime like they've done in the past, whether they shut down for the season, we don't know about that. What they have said is they don't want to do the gimmicks anymore, which is fine by me, even though I went up to the gimmick World Cup in Toronto in 2016. Talked about it at length before. It's a story for another day. Right now, what they want to do next year in, I guess, response to going to the Olympics and as an apology to the fans, finally realizing that fans don't want a gimmicky-ass All-Star game when we actually like to see some international competition, are going to have a four-team, are going to have like a four-team best-on-best. 
Now, you ask me, why is it only four teams? Because they said logistically it would have been possible to do it with any more. So your four teams are going to be USA, Canada, Sweden, and Finland. Now, this is going to be a little bit different right now, and this is not, nothing is set in stone with this right now. Instead of doing a round robin, what they're going to do is basically like a two-game aggregate series for each. So you'll have USA and Canada in North America, one game in USA, one game in Canada. How they do in soccer in Europe, whoever has the most goals at the end of the two games is going to qualify as a higher seed. The other team is going to qualify as a lower seed. Same thing with Sweden and Finland. One game in Sweden, one game in Finland, aggregate, same way. Then what they'll do is a crossover. The team that scored the most goals in the Sweden-Finland series will play the team that scored the less goals in USA-Canada series, vice versa for the other semifinal, and then they're going to have a final. I don't know if it'll be a one-game final or best of three final. They haven't determined that yet. I mean, listen, it's not it's not the best of circumstances, but it's something. Now, I know people are going to say, well, Ru- well, Russia is not playing. Okay, I know I said Russia. Uh, the Russian players aren't playing. Yes, that is something that needs to get figured out eventually. We don't know how it's going to get figured out. That's some, But that is something. And, they, and Matthew Snyder, who is with the NHLPA, has been saying, he goes, if we really want to be involved in a best-on-best, best, the Russian players have to play. If it's not for Team Russia, they have to play together on whatever team they want to call it. But they have to they have to be involved. And I agree with that. They do. They do. These guys, these guys do need to play. A lot of these Russian players don't like what's going on over there. This isn't a political show. We're gonna leave it at that. But yeah. for right now, it's the best they can do. It's also your high excluding the Russian players. It's your highest concentration of NHL players with those four countries. You know, you move on to countries like Germany, Czech Republic, Austria. You're going to be bringing in players from overseas who no one's ever heard of. At the end of the day, it is a money-making venture for the NHL. They want to have their players in the limelight, and these four countries are going to be both. Well, USA and Canada will definitely be made up of exclusively NHL players, and I'm going to say about 90% of Sweden and Finland probably will be too. There's been times where those teams have grabbed players from the leagues over in those respective countries, yes. But I think right now we're at a point too where they could probably stock those teams with all NHL players as well. So listen, it's not the greatest circumstances, but it's a start because they're trying to sell you on this stupid all-star game and how they don't need a best on best. Nobody's buying it. The all-star game format was changed yet again the other day. Now they're going to still do, which I'm got, which I actually wanted to say, but I'm just going to include it in here. It's going to still be a a three on three tournament of four teams, but now it's going to be choose up sides again. Like it used to be with celebrity captains. I'm going to speak for the hockey fan here. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of watching it. It's a gimmick. I don't want to watch it anymore. I'd rather watch those four teams play against each other in real games. And I don't care if somebody gets hurt. I'm sick of the goal. So no, I'd rather watch international competition. This generation was raised on it. My whole, basically my entire life, the best players with the exception of the last two limits, the best players represented their countries in international competition. So like I said, this isn't the best situation, but it's a springboard. It's something to start with. Well, the one thing I will say to kind of piggyback on the idea of the All-Star Weekend and the format being changed, the one thing I will say that I do like that the NHL is doing is it seems like they're actually showing support, like more support to the startup of the new women's league, the PWHL. Um, And I'm for that. I'm glad that we're getting some better representation from that. We've had some representation over the past few years in the skills competitions amongst professional uh, women's athletes in the All-Star weekend and festivities. However, I think this is a nice inclusion of the PWHL as well in this upcoming All-Star Weekend. That's one change that I do actually appreciate. And I really do wish the best for the startup of the PWHL, which starts up at the beginning of January. Uh, All the best for that uh, coming up. But Tom hits the nail around the head here. NHL fans have have been salivating over the idea of a best on best tournament again. And we're not getting that with the Olympics. We haven't gotten that with the Olympics in years at this point, almost a decade at this point. And it's frustrating because as Tom mentioned before, that's what our generation, mine and Tom gener- Tom's generation grew up with. Now, yes, prior to the early 1990s, 
you had mostly college kids in North America that were playing for these national teams. But ever since the NHL deemed it okay to send professional athletes to the Olympics and took that away, once you give it away, it's tough to take that away. Once you give something to the fans, it's tough to eventually just take that away from them, especially if it's a positive change and a way to positively you know, grow the NHL, which the Olympics was the best way to do that. So a one-off tournament might be a really nice idea. The format itself seems pretty solid. I understand why you pick those destinations of teams uh, to play in this tournament being USA, Canada, Sweden, and Finland. That is where your largest population of NHL players currently reside. It does suck to see that you have some countries that will be excluded in this that do ha uh, host a bevy of talented players, namely Germany, Switzerland, Austria, Czech Republic. You know, it is unfortunate that those countries aren't necessarily going to get the showcase. But I also feel like the NHL knows what they're trying to do with this best on best tournament. They're, it's dipping their feet in the water to see if they can do this more regularly moving forward and expand this going forward and make it a, a larger thing and, you know, make it more popular. So we're going to see what happens with this. I'm hoping for the best with this. Um, I'm going to gloss over these next two points. I'll be quick with these so you know for throwbacks quick hits on this one so first and foremost uh the nhl namely the commissioner of the nhl gary bettman uh he's received quite a bit of backlash over the past uh, few months with his handling of themed nights and you know, allowing teams to use, you know, themed apparel, not allowing teams to use themed apparel. You can do this. You can't do that. This player did that. Okay, so now everybody can do this. And that saga continues because Marc-Andre Fleury, goaltender for the Minnesota Wild, uh, prior to this weekend, put in for league approval uh, with Gary Bettman to use a goalie mask during warm-up for Native American Heritage Night. Uh, for Native American appreciation because his wife is Native American. Gary Bettman said, no, you may not wear that mask because it's in a uh, breach of our agreement amongst the NHLPA or whatever the case may be. So Marc-Andre Fleury, not one to back down, decided, you know what? Forget it. Wore the mask for warmups, wore the mask for the game. And Personally, I'm all for this because I am so sick of this whole, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. It's okay if you do this, it's okay if you don't, you know, it's not okay if you do this. Just let the players use whatever the heck they want. Let them represent what they want. So long as it's not malicious or attacking another group or another group of individuals or, you know, outright excluding other people as well. I see no problem with using a Native American heritage mask, especially if it is to honor somebody important in your life. That is just my two cents. Uh, Tommy, do you agree with me on this one? Yeah, it's turning into it's no matter what they do, somebody's going to complain. Yeah, nothing. Yeah. Uh, nothing can ever be perfect, and you're, you're not going to yeah. please everybody, unfortunately. Lastly, Colorado Avalanche defenseman Samuel Girard is going to be stepping away from the team uh, for an indefinite amount of time, and he's entering the substance abuse program, the NHL uh, Players Assistance Program, uh, namely. Uh, to paraphrase Samuel Girard, he has been dealing with. Uh, severe anxiety and ze severe depression, which led him to uh, alcoholism. And he is getting the help that he needs so that way he can return to the team in a better state of mind and also hopes and encourages others that could be silently fighting this battle to fight this battle with him and encourages those to uh, be brave and take the first step to getting the help that you need. And it's, you know, I'm going to say on my volition to, and on behalf of IED sports, if you currently are dealing with a problem such as this, either severe depression, severe anxiety, uh, alcoholism, drug abuse, whatever, uh, you know, other triggering thoughts in general, um, there are avenues, uh, to seek help and there are free avenues to seek that help. Uh, 
there are so many great options on Google and so many different things that you can Google and uh, even in your local community, uh, in community groups for these different things. We highly encourage those that need that help to seek that help that they need uh, moving forward. Um, but a tough situation for Samuel Gerard. You hate to see this with any player uh, to deal with this. And uh, behalf of IED Sports, we hope that Samuel Gerard uh, comes back 100% and that he's uh, ready to go and is in a healthier state of mind by the time he comes back to the Colorado Avalanche. Um, all right. Let's hit up our injury report real quick. I'll try to gloss through this. I know it can be a little bit difficult, but... Man, people just keep getting injured. It's really, really ugly right now. We have to deal with also a couple of season-ending injuries, don't we, Tom? Yep, unfortunately. Yep. So let's get into this. Neon High Mighty Ducks, Leo Carlson is questionable for Tuesday night with an undisclosed injury. He was held out of his last game with the same unknown issue, and it's unknown if he's going to take part in... Tuesday's tilt against the Vancouver Canucks. Trevor Zegris is going to be out indefinitely with, with a lower body injury. He's been placed on the injury reserve list, and there has been no timetable established for his return. Moving on down to the Arizona, Arizona Coyotes, Matt Dumba is questionable for Tuesday night with a lower body injury. He missed last game with a lower body injury, and uh, it's uncertain if he's going to play against the Tampa Bay Lightning. Moving on down. Uh, to the Buffalo Sabres. Jordan Greenway uh, is slated for an early December return uh, due to a personal matter that he is uh, unexpectedly dealing with at the moment. Um, and it's not expected that he's going to return before the end of this uh, November. It's likely that he returns maybe sometime either by this weekend or next week. Uh, and lastly for Buffalo, Zemgus Gergensen is going to be out indefinitely with a lower body injury. He has been placed on the injury reserve list, no timetable yet for his return. Going down to Calgary, Chris Tanev is questionable for Thursday's game against the Dallas Stars. Uh, he left his uh, last game with a uh, facial injury. I don't know if he actually got hit with a puck, hit with a stick. I'm actually not sure uh, what the extent of that injury was. Also questionable for Thursday night is goaltender uh, Jacob Markstrom. Uh, who is who was held out of uh, last game with an illness? So it's un it's uncertain that uh, his symptoms are going to go away prior to Thursday's game against the Dallas Stars. Uh, moving on down now, we alluded to this season ending ending injury before, and because the Chicago Blackhawks can never have nice things, Taylor Hall is going to miss the rest of the season with a knee injury, and he's going to be getting knee surgery after, uh, I believe he tore his ACL, correct, Tom? Uh, I'm going to check right now. I believe um, it was ACL, though. Yeah, and you know well, what the worst part, the, what's even worse about it is he could have been he could have been trade bait, too. He could have been trade bait if um, uh, if things weren't going well this year, which they were not. But I think people would have been placing calls for him, to tell you the truth. Um, oh, absolutely. You would have um, had a lot of teams ringing up for Taylor Hall's services, for it sure. Just says, it just says right knee injury. It doesn't say anything else. It doesn't mention ACL, MCL. It just it just says right knee injury. Well, that stinks but, either way. Uh, ACL surgery on right knee. Okay, ACL surgery on right knee. Okay, so, so he did tear he's his done. ACL. They're screwed. They can't even trade him now for, for assets. And, yeah, and as a Ranger fan, that's another one. That was another guy who I was thinking of, you know, maybe give them a call. Yeah, true, too. True, too. Also, for the uh, Chicago Blackhawks, out indefinitely is Andreas Athanasiu. Uh, he has been placed on the injury reserve list with a lower body injury. He is considered week to week moving forward. This is retroactive to Thursday, November 23rd. Uh, we already mentioned for Colorado, uh, Samuel Gerrard, so we're going to scroll right on past that. Uh, Columbus Blue Jackets, Daniil Tarasov, is slated for an early December return uh, after being designated with a knee injury prior to Thanksgiving. And he's expected to be sidelined for at least the next two to three weeks, more than likely the next two weeks. Uh, so we can expect him to be back in early December. Uh, not expected back in December at all, however, is Damon Severson for the Columbus Blue Jackets. He is an early January return 
at the earliest. He has been sidelined with an oblique injury, and his projected uh, time away from the ice is going to be six weeks. So that is a hell of a Christmas gift for Damon Severson, unfortunately, as well as the Columbus Blue Jackets faithful, however many there may be. Uh, <laughs> Dallas Stars, uh, Craig Smith is probable for Tuesday night's game against the uh, Winnipeg Jets after he missed his last two games with an illness. So more on that. Uh, the Detroit Red Wings now. We've got a few injuries to report here. Uh, Jake Wallman is probable for Wednesday night after missing his last two games with an illness. So it's likely that he is going to play up against the New York Rangers on Wednesday night. Uh, questionable for Wednesday night, however, is defenseman Justin Hull, who is dealing with an unspecified issue. And it's questionable right now that he suits up for his game against the New York Rangers as well. Uh, also out Wednesday officially uh, against the Rangers is Dylan Larkin. He's dealing with an unknown ailment at the moment, but it has been announced that he is going to sit out Wednesday's game against the New York Rangers. Well, with um, that being known, I doubt Patrick Kane plays tomorrow night at the garden. He'll, they'll probably save him for a home game. Yeah, I doubt it too. They probably got to get him into practice. I know he's been practicing in his own facility as well, but I don't see him suiting up for the Red Wings tomorrow. I just don't see that happening either. Uh, moving on down to the LA Kings, Blake Lazat is questionable Wednesday night with an undisclosed uh, ailment at the moment. He's missed his last three games with this same ailment, and uh, he's questionable for Wednesday night's game against the Washington Capitals. Uh, Tobias Bjornfoot is out indefinitely with an undisclosed injury. He's been placed on injury reserve and there's no timetable yet for his return. Uh, moving right along here to the Minnesota wild. We have a suspension here. Um, Ryan Hartman uh, received a two game suspension for a pretty egregious tripping call. If you ask me, and uh, he's eligible to return Sunday night against the Chicago Blackhawks. So he is going to miss the rest, the remainder of this week after uh, taking the suspension and he'll be back eligible to come back Sunday night against the Chicago Blackhawks. Moving on down to the Montreal Canadiens, we got a few injuries to report here. Uh, right off the bat, defenseman Arber Shakai is uh, has been officially shifted to the injury reserve list with an upper body injury, and there's no timetable yet for his return. Uh, when we reported this injury last week, he was not on injury reserve, so that's why there's an update here on that one. Uh, Sorry, I lost where I was. Uh, Jordan Harris is out indefinitely with a lower body injury. He's also been uh, placed on injury reserve. No timetable yet on his return. Uh, Richard Harvey Pernard uh, has been shifted to the injury reserve list, but it looks like uh, he's going to be shut down for a more determined amount of time, six to eight weeks. He is a late January return at the earliest at the moment with his lower body injury. Um, looking down now at the national predators, Cody glass is out indefinitely with an upper body injury. He's been shifted to the injury reserve list. No timetable yet for his return. Um, New Jersey devils, uh, prior to tonight's game, uh, Curtis Lazar was probable. He is playing in tonight's game, uh, against the New York Islanders. So looks like we're all good to go there. Eric Howla, though, however, I believe is out of the lineup tonight against the uh, against the New York Islanders. I just blanked on that one. Uh, he exited last game on Saturday night against Buffalo uh, with an undefined injury. It's not known what his injury is, and it's still questionable if he's going to suit up Thursday night against the Philadelphia Flyers. Um, Timo Meyer still out indefinitely with a lower body injury. He has not been placed on IR yet, though, so that should be noted. And <clears throat> Thomas Nosek is also uh, out indefinitely with his upper body injury that he sustained up uh, against the New York Rangers. Thanks a lot, Jacob Truba. <laughs> and uh, he has uh, been assigned to the injury reserve list, so Devils at least make room that way in their lineup. Um, moving down to New York Islanders, Matt Martin is questionable uh, Thursday night uh, against the Carolina Hurricane, uh, and 
Uh, he's been activated from uh, IR with his upper body injury, but it's still questionable if he's going to make his return on Thursday night against the Hurricane. Uh, out indefinitely, though, for the New York Islanders is Sebastian Ajo. Not that Sebastian Ajo, the other Sebastian Ajo. And uh, he's been shifted to the injury reserve list with an upper body injury. No timetable yet for his return. Uh, Adam Pellick is also out indefinitely with a upper body injury. Same thing. Shifted to the LTIR. And no official word yet on the return date or timetable. Uh, to the New York Rangers, well, uh, the Rangers dodged a bullet here. I really thought Capo Caco, uh, I really thought his season was over after what happened uh, to his knee. But uh, Peter Laviolette, the head coach of the New York Rangers, has come out and said that he's going to miss some time, but he is going to be okay. He's going to come back this season. Just undetermined yet how long he's going to be out. Uh, in the meanwhile, he is going to be shifted to the uh, injury reserve list uh, with, quote, a lower body injury. Adam Fox is probable for Wednesday night against the Detroit Red Wings after being activated from the injury reserve list with his lower body injury. So looking like Adam Fox is coming back this week. Much to the joy of Rangers fans uh, still out and definitely right now is Philip Heedle though. However, and there's still no timetable yet for his return. Correct there, Tom. Still no timetable. Yeah, They no. said he skated last week, but I'm hearing conflicting reports today. One was it was to play some retroactive on it for the third for cap purposes. Others are saying that even though he skated, he didn't feel any better and took a turn and felt even worse after he skated. I don't know what to believe with him anymore. But with the current situation of things right now, they really need to figure it out. Yeah. Uh, Ottawa Senators, we only got one injury here to report. Thomas Shabbat, uh, he is probable for Friday night against the Columbus Blue Jackets. He has been, uh, he's likely to be activated from the LTIR on Friday against the Columbus Blue Jackets after uh, his fractured hand has now healed up. So, Again, could provide the spark that Ottawa needs at the moment after trying to provide a spark and, you know, getting a massive game misconduct call in that last game. If you want to look back at the highlights, find the highlights from uh, the last game that Ottawa played against the Florida Panthers. That was bananas. <laughs> um, to the Philadelphia Flyers, uh, Noah Cates is out for... I would say indefinitely, but realistically until late January, he's been shut down with a lower body injury. He's expected to remain on the sidelines uh, for six to eight weeks, likely a late January return from a lower body injury. Um, Pittsburgh Penguins, Brandon Rust uh, is probable for Tuesday night uh, against the Nashville Predators uh, after missing the last three games with a lower body injury. Out indefinitely, however, though, is Ricard Raquel. Uh, he's been shifted to the injury reserve list with an upper body injury, and he is expected to miss, quote, an extended period of time. And uh, lastly, uh, out indefinitely for the uh, Pittsburgh Penguins, Chad Ruedel. Uh, he's been sent to the injury reserve list with a lower body injury. He's considered week to week. Uh, the San Jose Sharks. Um, Tomas Hertel is questionable Thursday night. Uh, after missing the previous uh, game that they played with an uh, abdominal injury. And it's uncertain if he's going to play on Thursday against the Boston Bruins. Also out and definitely is Philip Sedina. Uh, he's landed on the injury reserve list with an upper body injury. No timetable yet for his return. And lastly, Jan Ruta is also out and definitely with an upper body injury landing on the injury reserve list as well. Uh, Seattle Kraken <clears throat> out Tuesday night. Officially, he was uh, questionable before uh, coming into tonight, but out officially tonight. Uh, Brandon Tanev, uh, who missed the last game with lower body injury, is also going to miss tonight's game against the Chicago Blackhawks. Probable for tonight is Philip Grubauer, though, after uh, missing the previous two games with an undisclosed injury. But it's looking like he is expected to uh, make his return tonight against the Chicago Blackhawks. Questionable for Tuesday night, however, is Oliver Bjorkstrand uh, with an undisclosed injury. He missed the previous game with an undisclosed injury as well, and he's questionable for tonight. 
moving on down to the Toronto uh, Maple Leafs, uh, John Klingberg. It's looking like he's going to be back in the middle of December uh, after being placed on the LTIR a while ago with his hip injury. And it's looking like a mid-December return for him. So positive steps in the right direction for them. Vancouver Canucks, Pius Suter is out indefinitely with an undisclosed injury. He has uh, since been uh, listed on the injury reserve list. And lastly for Vancouver, Carson Soucy. Uh, has been shifted to the LTIR with a lower body injury. He's re- expected to be injured for at least the next six, six to eight weeks. Uh, looking like a mid-January return for Carson Soucy. Uh, Vegas Golden Knights, Alec Martinez is out indefinitely with a lower body injury. Uh, not placed on IR, but he is going to miss, uh, quote, some time. Uh, and Shea Theodore is also out indefinitely with an upper body injury. No timetable yet for his return, but he has been shifted to the IR. Um, Washington Capitals, TJ Oshie is also out indefinitely with an upper body injury. Also shifted to the IR. No timetable yet on his return. And that's it. A lot of injuries. Like I said, everybody just keeps getting hurt. It's just how it goes. We'll go quickly to wow or worrisome. There's not a whole lot that happened this week that makes things kind of wow or worrisome. However, we had some teams finally come back to earth this past week. Boston Bruins coming back down to earth. Vegas Golden Knights uh, starting to come back to earth a little bit. Vancouver really coming back down to earth at the moment. Uh, Tom, of these three teams, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Who would you be more worried about kind of coming back down to earth at the moment? And was the hype for real or... Uh, was it just you know fantasy land for either three of these teams? I mean, if anyone, it's the Bruins right now. Um, and it's a similar feeling as a Ranger fan. The year after they let Yager and and Shanahan and Avery basically walk, it's no stranger. They came flying out of the gate. You know, you you kind of had holes in the in the armor there. You know, you you didn't have Yager there anymore. You brought in Marcus Naslin and a reclamation project and Nikolai Jaredov that year. He said, we're going to give some more ice time to the younger guys. And they came flying out of the gate and everything was fine. And, oh, we don't need these guys anymore. We still have Lundquist. We still have the kids. And then as October turned into November, November turned into December, blah, 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 as the year went on, all of a sudden they started trending downward and downward and downward. They still made the playoffs to the low seed. But right now, could that have just been the Bruins just getting off to a sprint and then running out of gas? And I'm not saying the Bruins are going to miss the playoffs, but they came flying out of the gate to a point where people were saying they might break the record from last year. And now all of a sudden, they just lost three in a row to the Red Wings, to the Rangers, and then to Columbus last night. And the Columbus game I'd be the most concerned about. The Rangers are a good team. Red Wings are a good team. Columbus is not a good team. And Columbus really had their way with those Bruins last night. And, you know, if it comes this way, is it going to get to a point where the Bruins are going to have to do something drastic if they want to save their season and be a cup contender. Are they going to have to get on that phone and call about Elias Lindholm in Calgary or Thomas Hurdle out in San Jose for that center that's not there anymore? Because let's just beat around the – let's not beat around the bush, guys. Pavel Zak is not a number one center as much as everybody wants to claim that he is. So they're the one the cause for concern. The Vegas Golden Knights have been trending downward, but they have injuries to their top six D-men. At the same time, the division is starting to get a little bit stronger. Vancouver's having a good year. L.A. is killing it. And now all of a sudden, Edmonton is starting to trend a little bit upward. But if there was any team I'd worry about right now, it might be those Bruins. Now all of a sudden, the short things of Pavel Zaka and Matthew Poitra in the middle of the ice might not be sure, so sure anymore. Yeah, and not even that. I'm going to say something controversial. They weren't so sure to begin with. I mean, Pavel Zaka is a plenty fine NHL player. He's you're happy to have Pavel Zaka as a center on your team, but not as your one C he's just not, it's not fair to expect him to play up to the level of a number one center. It's just not fair for him to expect that. And it's, it's garnering a lot of hate for the poor guy. And I don't think it's fair. I think he's the poor guy's been kind of set up for failure because you need a legitimate number one center in Boston. I mean, you got some interesting names out there that Boston could go out and try and get, but at the moment they're coming back down to earth because that lack of center depth, they really miss Patrice Bergeron and David Krejci. Vegas is going to be fine. 
ultimately. I chalk this up to just getting a little bit banged up. Missing Alec Martinez hurts. Uh, missing Shea Theodore hurts. Uh, they're two of the top defensemen for the Vegas Golden Knights right now. This is just a bump in the road for them. I think Vegas is going to be fine. Vancouver, I would be a little bit worried about. Uh, I think that they've been a very good team to start this year, and we're certainly very hot. However, uh, I don't know. I think I would be a little bit worried for Vancouver, just knowing their track record from last year and the year before that. I think any signs of coming back down to earth is scary at the moment for them. But who knows? I think if a team is dark horse to really push through and continue their momentum, I think Vancouver is a team that I'd be comfortable saying that could continue their momentum. I would be worried if you were a Bruins fan right now, though. Yeah. I will openly say that. Under WoW, though, at the moment, I would say uh, the New York Rangers have been playing some of the best hockey in the NHL lately, and I will be more than happy to say that. They have been one of the best teams in hockey. However, I am still going to be on the bus in, with a lot of other players, and yes, perspective, and look at the other angle, and look at this, and look at that. I'm sorry, but that match against the Boston Bruins, Jacob Truba should have, he, he should not have gotten a fine. It should have been a suspension. I'm going to live and die on that hill. It was a dirty play. He has balance. You cannot tell me that that was a balance thing. He knew exactly what he was doing when he high stick Trent Frederick there. He knew exactly what he was doing. It's, I know Tom has his thoughts. I know we've gone back and forth on this. We're not going to beat a horse with another dead horse. It's not worth it. However, I'll just say that, state my piece. I was going to mention worrisome, though, however, for this section, the New Jersey Devils, but after Nico Heischer returned on Saturday night, I'm not so worried anymore. It turns out that Nico Heischer, Nico Heischer was the most important piece missing for the New Jersey Devils. They put up seven goals against the Buffalo Sabres, and now – actually look like they're potent selves again. So we'll see where this week takes the New Jersey Devils. They have a back-to-back -back Thursday and Friday night. They're playing currently right now against the New York Islanders, currently tied one-to-one. -one. And we'll see where the rest of this week takes the New Jersey Devils. We'll see what happens. All right, time to move on from here. Let's talk about some high-performance players of the week. Let's talk high-performance. Your I-80 Sports High Performance Players of the Week. Um, who are your players of the week? Well, I got to go with the guy who Minnesota should have never let go. Kevin Fiala. Yeah. Six points in his last five for the Kings who have been 8-1-1. One, and one. I said they were going to feel that loss up there in Minnesota. And they just fired Dean Evanson yesterday to bring in John Hines. We actually failed to mention that earlier. But yeah. we've talked enough about John Hines. We've talked enough about how Minnesota is <clears throat> practically doing everything wrong. So you figure you didn't want to hear us talk about that anymore. Uh, yeah. Nikita Kucherov, six points Friday night. First six-point game in the league this year. Hats off to him. Put him in first place in the scoring lead. Kucherov won't go away. Bolts won't go away. We'll see what happens. And let's just bring positive vibes to the Chicago Blackhawks. Connor Bedard had four points in his last five. Yeah, Connor Bedard also leading all NHL rookies in points at the moment, also leading NHL rookies in goals with 10 goals so far on the season. So congrats to him. And at least there's at least a beacon of shining light uh, for the Chicago Blackhawks at the moment. Um, how about other guys that, you know, Connor Bedard is currently being compared to? Let's talk Connor McDavid here, uh, who has had a bit of a dismal season so far for the Edmonton Oilers and just the Edmonton Oilers have just been having a dismal season to begin with. Uh, but in his last six games, Connor McDavid has 13 points, looking more like himself again, four goals, nine assists in that span of time as well. And, uh, his, uh, playing mate, Leon Dreisaitl has also been doing pretty well in that span of time too. In those same six games, three goals and six assists, nine points so far in the, uh, those last six games as well. Uh, my real top player, uh, from the last like week or so now though, is Kel McCarr. I mean, Kel McCarr is been on fire lately he has been looking over at vancouver with how well quinn hughes has been doing and he's just looking at him saying hey hold my beer and he has put up over his last seven games 14 points he is two points per game at the moment while also averaging over 25 minutes of ice timing in that time in in that span of time as well really really good stuff there 
for the Colorado Avalanche as well. But as we round out this episode of IED Sports, let's hit up our question of the day. And, uh, well, let's hear it. The best two teams to start this season were the Boston Bruins and Vegas Golden Knights. And, well, the question here is, given the, the fact that they've been falling back down to earth, are they hitting above their weight? Is it time to wave a red flag here? Or is everything just fine and dandy? Tom? I'll let you answer first. Kind of answered it already about both of them. The Bruins, I would say yes. The Knights, I would say no. But the thing about the Knights is the division's getting a bit stronger. I think the Bruins were just way above their weight and way overrated already to be worrying about it. It also seems right now the West looks a little bit better than the East. You have Vegas. You have LA. You have Vancouver and Edmonton getting better in Pacific. Out there in the Central, you have Dallas and Colorado. Winnipeg is having a good start. You get over to the East. You have the Bruins who have been punching above their weight. The Rangers have been good, but the Rangers right now is constructed. I'll just say it. I don't think they could win a cup as constructed. They need they need some tweaks. And then there's everybody else. The fact is, is that even if the Bruins tail off, they could still make it and probably still have a chance to do some damage, where if the Knights tail off, they could risk losing some home ice advantage and get themselves into a uh, – Non-favorable matchup in round one, especially with the Pacific the way it is. Pacific is, which we predicted to be one of the worst divisions in the league, is all of a sudden really, really tight now. We didn't think that this was going to happen. But it, it could be a really tight four-way race between them, Edmonton, Vancouver, and L.A. We have to see. Especially in L.A. L.A. has been one of the hottest teams over the last two weeks as well. They've been, along with the New York Rangers, one of the best teams in the NHL uh, over the last two weeks as well. And I, I need to mention the L.A. Kings here of how well they've been doing. Uh, they've been white hot. But like we said, we answered it a little bit before, or at least I answered it a little bit before. I don't think it's time for Vegas to wave a red flag at the moment and be that nervous. If... Alec Martinez and Shea Theodore come back from injury not looking quite like themselves, then I would start to flag a little bit. Or if you have more injuries that start to pile up uh, from a potential cup hangover and just maintenance needing to be made from a longer extended season, then yeah, it might be time to wave a bit of a red flag and maybe start considering maybe making one or two minor moves to try to right the ship. Boston, though, I think it's time to start waving a little bit of a red flag. I know it's early on in the season, but they need center help, and they need it now. And hopefully uh, Boston doesn't go into desperation mode and give up too much to try to make that move happen. But as always, guys, what do you guys think? Do you agree? Do you disagree with our takes? You got to let us know down below. And while you're here, hit the subscribe button youtube.com slash IID sports hit the bell notification so that way you guys know when our videos go live and hit up our other content as well the fantasy football season is starting to round out so you've got teams that are going to be making the playoffs soon you want to hit up their content so that way you know who to start and who to sit coming up in the coming weeks as well as we start to make those big time money decisions so hit up our content let us know what you think hit up the comment section down below what did you guys think of what we covered today Join the conversation and we'll join the conversation back. And if you're still on X, make sure you follow us down below at I80 underscore sports NHL. And if you follow us already, thank you guys so much because we greatly value all of your support. But once again, we've come to that special time where it's time for us to stop talking, time for us to keep watching. So until then, I'm Brian. He's Tom. This has been yet another episode of NHL on I80 Sports. Oh, this is